Welcome back, students. Where we last left off, we were talking about Charlemagne's Europe, and today we're going to be uh, exploring medieval society in Europe a little bit further. Uh, our objectives today are to assess what you already know about the Dark Ages. Uh, you should be able to describe and discuss feudal society in Europe in depth, and we're going to be looking at some art history uh, today. Uh, not in depth, but briefly uh, talking about art history and art in the Middle Ages. Um, if you haven't already done so, you should head over to our Google Classroom and perform the um, anticipation guide on Google Forms for this uh, lesson. So if you haven't done that, please do that first before you continue with the video. Um, so moving on, we're going to start by looking at uh, some sources here, some primary sources in the form of some maps. How did a period of instability after Charlemagne's empire affect Western Europe? So here in this first map, we can see Charlemagne's empire. Um, and the key will be helpful for this analysis. And then the, on the right, we have invasions in Europe. So take a look at these maps for a moment. Think about how you would answer this question. So the first thing that you might notice by looking at these two maps side by side is that we have a cohesive empire on the left, um, even as it's divided into eastern, central, and western kingdoms. Um, it's still under you know, the auspices of Charlemagne. Um, on the right, we see that this same empire is uh, a battleground, that it's being attacked on all sides from Vikings from the north, Muslims from the south, and Magyars from the east. Uh, the Magyars we haven't spoken about much, but they're an ethnic group um, from around the Carpathian Mountains in what would be modern-day Hungary and, and that region. Uh, so we can see that Charlemagne's empire that we've described as a, a beacon or a light in the European Dark Ages is uh, flickering, to say the least. If we look at this document, um, here is a description of what Europe was like in the 9th and 10th centuries. Uh, this was written in 1922, so... It's not really a primary source. Um, I have it mislabeled here. This is a secondary source, obviously, because it's not written at the time. Uh, but it's still illustrative for our purposes. So uh, let's think about what life may have been like in medieval Europe based on the maps and this excerpt. The barbarians have broken through the ramparts. The Saracen invasions have spread in successive waves over the south. The Hungarians swarm over the eastern provinces. They sack town and village and laid waste the fields. They burned down the churches and then departed with a crowd of captives. There is no longer any trade, only unceasing terror. The peasant has abandoned his ravaged fields to avoid the violence of anarchy. The people have gone to cower in the depths of the forests or in inaccessible regions or have taken refuge in the high mountains. Society has no longer any government. So if words like chaotic, uh, hopeless, you know, if terms like this come to mind, um, you wouldn't be far off from what many historians have sort of uh, concluded that the, the Middle Ages in Europe were like. So in case you didn't know, uh, here's a working definition of feudalism. Feudalism was a political, social, and economic system based on loyalty, land holding, and protective alliances. Uh, we also see feudalism in Japan, and we'll talk about that uh, more in depth you know, in the coming weeks. But feudalism we can think of as, in essence, a political system. How do you run uh, a society that doesn't have much in the way of government. Uh, it is much more local than it is central. Um, 
I want you guys to uh, take a look at Google Classroom and make sure that you are uh, completing the handout titled Feudal Life. Um, and as usual, you'll be annotating and answering those questions. So um, you can pause the video at this point and return to it, um, but make sure you do complete that handout. Here we have an overview of a, uh, a medieval uh, feudal manor. So we can see here how organized and self-sufficient the feudal manor was. You have the manor house, you have blacksmiths, you have bakeries, villages, a church, uh, everything that you would need you know, in order to be self-sufficient and not really require much in the way of trade. Um, most of what you would need for basic survival would be right there. Um, and in uh, this particular time in our own history, it makes me wonder um, how forward-thinking these people were, that uh, they would want everything to be within arm's length. Um, here's another view of, uh, or another recreation, we should say, of a feudal manor. And again, very similar layout the manor house, the church, uh, the fields for planting. You have the, uh, the various trades, the mill, the blacksmith, uh, the bakers and such. So that brings us to another term that we should know, which is manoralism. And manoralism is the economic system. It sort of explains um, how land is used. So where feudalism describes the political system of who's in power, manoralism describes the economic system of what people are doing with the land. So in this case, uh, the lord of the manor is given a gift of land uh, in exchange for his loyalty to some greater individual, uh, a king or a greater lord. And then the Lord can exploit the serfs who are tenants to work his estate. Um, so let's review what we've done, answer a couple questions based on these two definitions. Take a look at this image. At this point, you should be able to recognize that this is a feudal estate, a feudal manor. The area depicted was best described by, one, the manor system and the importance of land ownership, two, absolute monarchies and strong central government, three, decreased emphasis on religion in daily life, or four, extensive trade with Asia and the Middle East. Hopefully you've gotten this one. That should be an easy one. Number one, the manor system. Let's look at this one. Which characteristic would likely be most prevalent in the area depicted? Rapid social change, high literacy rate, industrial-based economy, or rigid class structure? Yeah, so the answer here is four, rigid class structure. Obviously, social change, literacy, you know, a booming industrial economy, these are all positive things, and usually we think about the the feudal system and Euro the European Middle Ages as being sort of, uh, you know, stuck in the in the mud at the very least, or or moving backwards at, at worst. So rigid class structure is our our answer here. So for our art analysis, uh, I'm going to post these images on our Google Classroom, and I'm going to hope that you uh, follow the instructions to analyze each of these works and then discuss author context, and audience for each one. Um, follow the directions on our Google Classroom. I want to show you some art uh, that I've personally witnessed. These were all taken at the Cloisters Museum, which is part of the Metropolitan Museum, and this was in uh, Upper Manhattan. Uh, this is a medieval triptych, so it's a, a work of art with three panels. Um, so we can see the beautiful um, engraving here, uh, you can see at the, the base there, the etching, really high level craftsmanship. 
the individuals here, always with a religious um, a religious angle to them. Another uh, main feature of medieval art is the illuminated manuscript. So literacy was very, very low during the Middle Ages. So it's really monks who are literate. And most of the day in a monk's life is spent writing out scripture, uh, recreating Bibles, writing scripture, and producing these illuminated manuscripts. Uh, and you can see how beautifully they're decorated. These are all hand-lettered, hand-painted, uh, and they're adorned with things like these, uh, these initials here that were all hand-drawn. Uh, the border work was all hand-drawn. The marginalia, you would have these little images in the margins. Uh, and they went from very basic, depending on the skill level of the monk, to very elaborate. Um, if you notice the halo and the shield here are shining, that's because they are inlaid with uh, 24 karat gold leaf. Here again, you can see the gold leaf being used for all the stars, uh, all hand lettered, beautiful. And here, uh, we don't have gold, but we can see just the time and the care that was being used to produce such a rich marginalia. All of these notice are written in Latin, which was the language of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, be sure to head over to Google Classroom and check out a fun video. Uh, this was from Vox, and uh, it describes... The, the troubling depiction of medieval babies in art. Uh, so watch that video and enjoy. Uh, and I think that's all we have. So um, take care of this week's um, handouts and assignments and tasks, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Take care.